the 1st of December, 2049, and today we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of human habitation on Mars. I look outside my bedroom window, and all I see is red, endless fast planes of red. I ask, hey Google, what's the weather like today? Well, it's going to be a negative of 125 degrees Celsius with a high of 27. Radiation level is going to be from high to extreme with a slight chance of showers. And I mean meteor showers. One more thing, there might also be a dust storm that will engulf the entire planet for several months at a time. So I get up feeling motivated, and I decide that it's a good idea to go for a walk outside. I'm so fast getting around my house because I'm traveling at one third of Earth's gravity. Now, as a last minute check, I need to make sure that I have no pressure leaks in my home system and that I've got enough water in my storage. Now, only then, I can start to actually put on my walking suit. 45 minutes later, I'm an onion with layers and layers of protective material, but at least now, I'm ready to go for my morning walk. As I exit, I think to myself, how did we get here? How did all of this happen? Now, this was no longer the stuff of science fiction. This incredible scenario that I just described to you will only be made possible through our constant drive to innovate. Innovation is often achieved when you can start to identify and articulate an unforeseen need or problem. You start to question yourself and your surroundings and ask, can this be better? Or imagine what the world would be like if we improved the way this works. Now, on the opposite spectrum, innovation can also be forced out of an extreme need or urgency. Regardless of your, which path you take, world-class innovation can only be achieved when boundaries are pushed and tested, conventions are broken and redefined, all in a highly collaborative environment. So I am a computational designer. Now, most of my time is spent coming up with uh, new tools and workflows such as this one, and even being lucky enough to experiment with high-tech toys. The remaining of my time, I spent nerding out on games, fantasy, and science fiction. I mean, this was me 10 years ago, dressing up as a transformer as I get ready for athletics carnival. <laughs> so, as designers, we get really excited when it comes to problem solving and finding a good challenge. So my colleagues and I at Hustle Studio wanted to find one of the biggest architectural challenges out there. We wanted to see and explore how to best design extreme habitats. But we didn't want to just limit ourselves within the urban domain or even within the extreme temperatures of the South Pole. No. We wanted to explore here. So off we go into our interplanetary conquest by putting together a proposal for NASA's Centennial Challenge to design a 3D printed habitat on Mars. Now the brief was quite simple. We needed to come up with a scheme and design that would support four astronauts to live on Mars for an entire year. What they essentially wanted was a home and a workspace, all which is pretty familiar to us on Earth, but incredibly difficult to achieve on Mars. And the real difficulty comes in extreme conditions that they must endure, not only throughout their stay on Mars, but also in the entire duration of the mission. No matter where you are in the universe, you want to make sure that you're comfortable and, most of all, safe. Now, to further add to the complexity of the design brief already, there are extreme limitations and challenges when it comes to bringing things to Mars. It would, at minimum, cost $24,000 for every kilo you bring into low Earth orbit, let alone Mars, which is much, much further. And that's just getting there. There's a whole other set of complexities when you start thinking about the construction, fabrication, and even maintenance of your habitat. You can't exactly just pop up on a roof to fix a leak. Now, reinforcing the uh, significance of this challenge, NASA even introduced their own agenda called in-situ resource utilization. All the competing teams must then come up with a design and a scheme of a habitat that is mostly made up of materials already found on Mars. In our case, we needed to use the abundance of Martian dust called regolith. Now, it's a really toxic material for us, but you can melt it and sinter it to make a protective shield. Now, it is these sorts of extreme circumstances that forces the use of creative thinking, combined with implementation of previous innovations and technology towards problem solving. If you design a bad building on Earth, you're going to get really unhappy people. But if you design a bad building on Mars, there's a high chance that your astronauts won't be able to come back. 
Now, historically speaking, the space industry has been solely reserved for very, very specialized fields. Creative thinking and design is then seen as a luxury rather than an imperative process to achieve innovation. Here, we had the chance to challenge that notion. So, how are we going to build a habitat on Mars? Well, whether it's on Earth or on Mars, designing for extreme environments requires a high degree of expertise. We needed to collaborate with the right people to amass the knowledge we needed in such a short time frame. So we held a small symposium and invited along experts such as Martian meteorologists, radiation scientists, roboticists, mining engineers, and even space anthropologists to help us view the problem from various angles. One of the biggest challenges we faced as a team was to figure out how this thing was actually going to get built. We needed to envision the construction process from start to finish. Now, over 50% of previous Mars missions have failed. So the idea of bringing all your construction material and machinery was out of the question. NASA even specified that the scheme had to be autonomously 3D printed because any direct communications between Earth and Mars would have a 20-minute time lag. Now, knowing the success rate, we also needed to incorporate what is known as a system of redundancy, which means that we needed to have enough backup systems in place to ensure that if anything goes wrong along the way, the mission will still continue. The majority of commercial 3D printing technologies today usually involves a print head that's uh, multi-axis and is contained within some sort of protective frame. Now, the issue with this approach is that the size of your printed object is limited to the size of your containment unit. If you are to take the same approach to Mars, you'd essentially need a 3D printer the size of this room. So, here's our plan. In phase one, we'll deploy an ecosystem of 3D printing robots months before any astronauts ever set foot on Mars. Their main task will be to construct a protective shield against small meteorites and radiation. For our proposal, instead of one robot that does it all, we are proposing a modular robotic swarm strategy made up of small, autonomous, intelligent robots that have interchangeable roles, from battery storage to scout rovers, logistics to excavational, and even interchangeable 3D print heads. All of them will also be integrated with multiple cameras and sensors. They can also reconfigure themselves for a multitude of purposes, ensuring that they have a life beyond the initial build phase. In phase two, pressure-retaining habitat modules prefabricated on Earth are then sent to Mars. The main idea behind them is this idea of reconfigurability. Spaces are divided through a movable rack system, enabling astronauts to customize their space according to the functional needs. The prefabricated modules must also be able to withstand the pressure differences between the two atmospheres, as any error in the quality and the build will have lethal consequences. Now, together, these two make up our 3D printed habitat on Mars. What's unique about our approach is that we're literally taking the best of both worlds to combine for a coherent solution. Now, it's funny to think that, um, as a kid, I used to play a lot with Legos and robots and Power Rangers, say. These are systems that are able to combine and morph to become more powerful as they assemble. Technology today has pretty much the power to enable the realms of imaginations and science fiction. Now, conceptual exploration such as this should not be just taken as a joke, but rather as an opportunity to start to question and be critical about the current conventions of the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Now, historically speaking, Bespoke solutions made for extreme use cases have become the basis of innovation within another context. Now, it is the discourse between design and engineering that should not be categorized into their respective fields. Design should not just be seen as a beautiful representation or a post-rational vision of a project. Now, we as designers should not also shy away from complexities and technicalities. I mean, at our core, we are both serving the common purpose for the advancement of the human civilization. So, the task now is to question how we can continue to open up and create more forums and platforms for cross-collaboration, combining our expertise into this hyper-connected community 
that continues to push the boundaries of our respective fields. It is the symbiosis of all of these multiple disciplines that holds the key to success in designing and solving highly complex problems, such as designing for extreme environments, and hopefully one day how to go for a walk on Mars. Thanks.